So thank you for taking the time, first of all, to meet with me this afternoon. You know, I haven't actually gotten the chance to meet you yet, so um, I'm happy that I got to be able to. I'll give you a little bit of background on me before we get started. So I'm the STEM coordinator here at the Workforce Board. I've been here for about seven months or so. I started just before COVID actually hit. So I've just been working on um, moving our programs to virtual platforms and really just assisting Kara in any way that I can with all the craziness going on so um but i'm really interested to take this time to you know to get to know more about you and how you got to the position that you're in today um i know that you currently work for senator sears office as a district director so do you mind just giving a brief overview of the responsibilities that come with your role sure so <laughs> honestly if anyone can tell me what my responsibilities are i would pay them my annual salary because <laughs> it's Every day it seems that there's a different responsibility or a new mm -hmm. one and it changes based on what's going on, um, you know, what the yearly calendar is. There's a, there's a legislative cycle and so it depends on what kind of period and phase we're in legislatively. It depends on what's going on. Obviously things have shifted drastically mm -hmm. in response to the pandemic. Right. Um, and so what the way I would have answered this question back in February and March of this year is very different from, you know, what my job and my, the description of the job looks like today um, but you know it broadly speaking it is working with constituents so the people in the residents of Cape Cod Martha's Vineyard Nantucket it is communicating and liaising with organizations on the Cape and Islands the towns on the Cape and Islands Barnstable County mm -hmm. Cape Cod's very unique in that we have a very active and um, strong county government. No other county in the Commonwealth really has that. Mm. So we're unique in that sense that there's kind of this, this layer that's not necessarily above or below, but it's a partner with, you know, us at the state level, the towns, gotcha. you know, and then we have this county that kind of represents everything. So gotcha. um, yeah, so it, it's, it's basically just kind of being an extra set of eyes, ears, mm -hmm. and, and a half a brain anyway. I don't know if I would call myself yeah. a full brain. You know, another brain for Senator Sear to help work with the district so gotcha. okay yeah. and now um jeff you grew up on the cape too right yeah so i was um not born but i was raised on cape cod i moved there before i can remember so i've, I've lived there my whole life as far as i know yeah um and yeah i, I grew up in barnstable um and, and that's been gotcha you know, yeah, and you also went to Sturges and then later went to Four Seas after you graduated high school, right? Yep, so I went to Sturges, I graduated. I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do with my life. My mom is an educator. She was a teacher at Barnstable Public Schools okay. um, and she always was very uh, adamant that education is about much more than your experience just in the classroom. It's also about you know everything that you get in life and, and being outside of the classroom. Um, and so she just didn't feel that I needed to be shipped off to college and spend whatever a college education is right off the bat if I didn't know what I wanted to do. Sure. You know, she said, I'm not going to pay to make up, I'm not going to pay for you to make up your mind. Right. Um, and so I went abroad for a quick period, which was great. I did a work study program over in France and, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of, you know, that was, that filled the immediate gap right after high school graduation. Okay. Um, and then I came back and I, I still didn't really know what I wanted, what I was interested in. So I went to Four C's, mm -hmm. took some courses there and loved it. I had a great experience, nice. um, you know, and it just was really, it gave me an opportunity to try out different things. Mm -hmm. I graduated high school loving science and wanting to go into, you know, some type of biochemical type field. You know, I loved biology and I loved chemistry. Yeah. And I went to Four C's. I just had some uh, wonderful experiences with a couple of the professors there who really switched me on to different courses, one of which was economics. I ended up, when I did go off and transfer for, for, to a four-year college, I ended up studying economics. So okay. still a science, but a social yeah. science as opposed to Right. Yeah. So now what would you tell a student about the educational potential that Cape Cod Community College has? You know, I would just say that the caliber of professors that I had there um, was incredible. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had a lot of friends and family who, you know, kind of turned their nose up when, you know, they knew or heard that I was going to Cape Cod Community College. And there is stigma associated with a community college. Right. But both from my experience of being a student there and attending them, as well as my experience now working with the community yeah. colleges and working with the administrators who are running these organizations, 
they're some of the most committed and dedicated people that I have ever encountered. Mm -hmm. They want you to achieve success more than anybody that you will ever meet, including and often yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they're just so committed to that. They're so dedicated. That is really why they are there. Yep. You know, I went to a very reputable four-year university, mm -hmm. you know, and I had some phenomenal professors there and I'm very grateful for where I ended up. Mm -hmm. But I will say that a lot of them were there because they got paid to do research. Mm -hmm. They were researchers. They wanted to explore and research their field. Teaching was just this other faculty and this other thing that they had to do while they were working on their research. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I was at Cape Cod Community College, those professors were there because they wanted to teach students. Mm -hmm. And it really showed both through their commitment, through their, uh, the, the way that they interacted, their office hours. At, I mean, I had classes till nine o'clock at night and they would right. be there. They were accessible. You know, and when I got to a big 25,000 student population university, I didn't have that access to people sure. again, you know? Right. So it, it, it's a resource. I, I yeah. tell people, do your time, go to, go to a community mm -hmm. college. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, they're great. Now yeah. also, um, so I understand you went overseas to further your education. So what prompted yeah. you to do that? So again, I had done that gap year, as they call it, mm -hmm. uh, after high school graduation. Mm -hmm. And I had been abroad in Europe and I had some family friends who, uh, well, they were European. They spent, you know, they, they lived on Cape Cod, but they were actually from Italy. And, cool. uh, you know, so she was just a proponent of go to school here. There's these wonderful schools here. And it just kind of opened my eyes to thinking, well, you know, America is a population of what, 330 million or so at that point. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we're a small percentage of the world. And guess what? People are educated when you leave American borders, you know, like there yep. are smart people in the rest of the world, they yes. go to college. So guess yes. what? That means there's colleges out there that are educating these people. Right. So, you know, we're very America centric and we don't always think that there's a whole big wide world out there that's educating people and doing research and functioning very well and very successfully. Yeah. Um, so it just kind of opened my eyes to a different perspective and I just hopped online and it was my mother. All of this, I give credit to my mother. She was my biggest <laughs> advocate. She was, you know, online looking at colleges, looking at universities, looking where I could study, looking for opportunities. And it was just this very serendipitous series of events that led to us Googling, you know, universities in the United Kingdom, finding this university, which was the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, sending them an email to their, you know, uh, international admissions department. They were super responsive, got back to me very quickly and said, hey, our admissions officer is going to be in Boston, you know, in a month or so, wow. we'll set up a meeting with you. And so we just, you know, had this meeting with this woman. I still remember her name. It was Rebecca. And she was incredibly helpful, oh, encouraging. Wow. You know, she said, just work with me. We'll sort out your application. We'll, we'll help you. We'll look through the process. Mm -hmm. And it was just this series of events that happened that, uh, just kind of fell together and you know again it was a lot of hard work with from my mother figuring out how do we make this happen can we get loans because I did I you know I did need to take out loans to go right. um, but tuition was also about a tenth of the price of what I would have paid for a comparable university here in America so that was a you know an encouraging factor yeah um, so yeah it just it was it was serendipity a bit of luck a bit of dumb luck a bit of uh, you know um, hard work um, and it just kind of awesome. fell into place that's so awesome. Now, what did you get your degree in, Jeff? Um, so I studied economics. So okay. I, um, you do, their degree system in Scotland is a bit different. You pick basically, um, you, you declare your major right off the bat. So you get there, you've already declared what you're going to study. And so mine was business and economics. Okay. Um, and so I had two components to it. Uh, but yeah, it was, I would ultimately say it was political economics is effectively okay. what we would call it. Gotcha. The degree there was called economic history, but yeah, it was. It was gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So now, now that you're settled back in the U.S. and as a young person, you know, how did you secure that position uh, working with Senator Sear? Volunteerism. Um, so to condense in a nutshell, so I, I did my four-year degree abroad, and then after that I actually moved to Australia for another four or so years, so I was abroad there. Um, and then through just some political change in Australia, the visa that I was on got axed, so I had to come back to the U.S. pretty unexpectedly, and I got okay. back here. And yeah, Cape Cod was home, but I hadn't been in the country for about nine or ten years, and so um, I 
needed to get involved. I needed to meet people. I needed to network. And I knew I needed to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I just started attending things. I started going to events. I started going to fundraisers. I started meeting people that I could. And through some of this volunteerism, I ended up meeting this, you know, kid who was my yeah. age, you know, a year or two older than me, yeah. who happened to be running for state senate. And a couple of people were like, oh, you need to get involved with him. You need to meet him. So we did, and I ended up volunteering for a couple of events as he was campaigning before he was elected. Um, and then we just maintained, you know, uh, the networks and kept in touch. And uh, I think it was about a year into his first term in office, there was a position that became available in his office and he knew my name because he knew the work that I had done. He had seen right. me do it for him and, uh, you know, he seemed to be pleased enough with the results. And so he personally texted me and said, hey, there's a position in my office, would you be interested? And I was absolutely interested. Yeah. So, you know, I attribute it all to just volunteering and getting mm -hmm. active and, and, and networking. I mean, right. we were just talking about this in the office, but networking is essential. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to do it. It's hard to figure out how to be good at it. Right. I am horrible at it and I right. hate doing it. <laughs> and so just be genuine with it and yeah. it, will, it, it will pay off like it did for me. Right. So now in the landscape with the recession, so many students are unable to find internships and part-time jobs. So what, what advice would you give to those young adults who are considering pursuing like a volunteer position? Mm -hmm. You know, having the privilege to volunteer is a privilege. And so yeah. we need to recognize it as that. And it, it, having the privilege to accept an unpaid internship is a privilege. You have to have means if you're able to do that. And it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wish we could create opportunities for everybody to be able to access these internships and to be able to gain the experience that you do through them. So there's that piece of it, you know, and unfortunately yeah. we can't fix that overnight. Um, right. Right. But I would just say, you know, just be strategic in it. Honestly, the way, so my career path has been kind of all over the map. You know, it, it's been jagged. I jumped from, I was in retail, I was in hospitality, I've been in uh, you know, government, I've been in the education sector, I've been kind of all over the map. Um, but one thing that's always helped me thinking about where the next step is, or where I want it to be anyway, has been find people that inspire you, go to their LinkedIn page, and just yeah. work backwards. Yeah. See the job that they're in, see the job that they were in before that, see the job that they did before that, see yeah. where they went to school, see what they studied, and just kind of backtrack. Yeah, totally. um, you know, and, and, and just deconstruct their process and right. see how you can take that perspective and think, okay, well, if I want to be this person in 20 years, what kind of steps do I think I can take to get there? Right. You know, and people understand it's difficult. We understand, you know, there's, there are the memes that go around that say, you know, entry level job. I want five years of experience. You're not going to get paid very much. <laughs> you should have a master's degree. You know, we all get that. And it is, it's, it's overwhelming and it's frustrating okay. and, you know, I don't know, five to 10 years into my professional career, I still feel frustrated by that. I still see jobs that I want, but I'm like, there's no way I could ever get this yeah. job. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, you know, just take it in steps, break it down. Um, and people want to help. That, you sure. know, one of the biggest lessons that I've ever learned is people want to be helpful. Yeah. We want to pass on our experiences. We want to help the people who are coming up behind us. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to climb up to the top and then pull the ladder up. Yep. There are people that do, but, you know, we'll yep. assume that people inherently are good. Right. And they want to hold that ladder there for the next people to come up behind them. Mm -hmm. So just look for those people who want to help you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think it kind of falls back, too, on, you know, why we're doing these little mini interviews, this new initiative that we started, because we really want them to be a great resource for the students to go go and visit our YouTube channel at any moment in time and see these different interviews with different partners in the community and really see their career pathway. I heard so many wonderful stories about how engraved you have been and how many activities you participated in here at the Workforce Board with us. So is there one activity that's most memorable to you? Um, I mean, I've really enjoyed the opportunities I've had to work directly with kids. You know, there's been a couple of times where I've sat on a panel with some other wonderful community people um, and just spoken with students, you know, high school age students. And I had every opportunity and every privilege growing up. And I don't say that to brag. I say that in the sense that I had every stepping stone to achieve right. success. Yeah. But I recognize that there are the vast majority of people who don't. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, 
again, I don't want to pull that ladder up behind me. I want to mm -hmm. hold it there and make sure it's more sturdy and more secure for the people behind me. Yes. But not only that, I want to put another ladder and then I want to build some steps and then an escalator and, you know, really just elevate everybody and anybody that I can. So working with the students and talking to them directly and hearing the things that they're concerned about and scared about and anxious about, you know, and, and just being able to relate to them and say, hey, yeah. I'm still anxious. I'm still scared. Yeah. I'm still worried about these things, mm -hmm. you know, help, let me help you. Let right. me try to, you know, show you that there's a way you can surmount these obstacles or you right. can work around them. And if we can't, then let's try to figure out a way that we can build some way for you to work around them or access yeah. something that will help. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely those opportunities working with the kids that I really enjoyed. Yeah. Now, also with COVID-19, things had seemed to shut down overnight. So was it difficult for constituents to have questions answered, you know, and if so, how did your office ensure that questions were getting answered? So one of my biggest challenges in my role, and one of the things that frustrates me the most, is I cannot help enough people. You know, there's always another phone call, there's always another email, there's always another person who needs help. And sometimes it's frustrating because even working for a state senator, there are limitations to what we can do, and there are guidelines and restrictions on things. And I hear these heart-wrenching cases all day long of people who are in legitimate crises, and I wish I could do more to help them all. Um, we're really lucky on Cape Cod. We have this incredible coalition of organizations who have kind of, you know, sprung up both recently, but also some are very long-term and established organizations that have been around for a while. Because people think that Cape Cod is this beautiful, glamorous beach resort. You know, you come here to play golf and sail your boats and whatever. <laughs> Yeah. And there's that aspect of it, and that provides opportunities through our tourism industry and our hospitality industries. But there's also a side of it that doesn't get publicized in the Boston Globe about, you know, the 10 best places to eat and stay on Cape Cod in the summer when you go there for one week. And organizations and, and local groups, municipalities, the county, have recognized this, and they have come together to find solutions. And um, yeah, we, we just have a robust landscape of human service organizations down here. And that's something that is unique to the Cape. I mean, we get it right in so many ways on Cape Cod in trying to help the people that are here and help our own. Um, and so it's just really been utilizing them and leaning on them as partners yeah. to say, hey, if you need food, here's these organizations. If you need some healthcare, right. there's, we have great community health centers on the Cape. If you need housing, we have some wonderful housing organizations. Right. You know, so I, I like to tell people on the switchboard for Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket, call me. If you, yeah. you know, just pick up the phone and call us. And I don't have the answers, but I usually know who does have the answers. True. So I'll try right. to connect you. And just make yeah, sure. yeah. Now, I know COVID-19, as you mentioned, it's been so stressful for everybody. You know, it's been a big transition and trying to find that new normal. So what have been some practices you've been following for self-care, you know, in your own personal life. <laughs> I laugh because my boss, Senator Sear, often comments how I'm so good at prioritizing self-care. Oh. I think I'm terrible at it. I don't believe, <laughs> it, you know, but I, I do. I, I try to, you know, my big things are exercise and mm -hmm. just kind of me time. You know, right, I right. avidly did yoga before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, my yoga studio closing down was one of the most impactful things. And again, I know that that comes from seeming privilege because, you know, I've got the time and the ability to go and do yoga, but it really was a space to remind me to compartmentalize things, to break things down. My yoga instructor was, she is a wonderful person. She was a really good inspiration and a really good mentor for me in probably ways that she will never realize. Uh, and so that was really hard. It was really hard for me to take my routines. You know, I would go to the gym or I would, you know, do all my meal preps or I would go to my yoga studio and that was my retreat. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me to shift going into the pandemic, you know, but I finally just got to a point that was not sustainable. Work was incredibly taxing. Mm -hmm. um, again, these cases that I was hearing of people who need help with unemployment claims or who need health care, who have lost their jobs and are you know, worried about evictions, things like this. I'm an empathetic person and those weigh on me. And so I'm grateful that I'm able to help them, but it does become personally uh, exhausting, quite honestly, sometimes right. to, to not feel like I can do as much for these people as I would want to. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, just implementing routine and trying to find some structure and to establish some consistency mm -hmm. is my biggest thing. Try to, you know what? There's plenty of free yoga courses on YouTube. Sure. Go and take a yoga class <laughs> yeah. online, you know, or I can go outside and I can get exercise. I have a yeah. bike. I can go ride my own bike. Actually, yeah. honestly, what did a, 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 a huge amount for me initially was my mother, who, like I said, is a teacher, uh, was also teaching remotely. And that was very stressful for teachers to all of a sudden shift to having to educate their students on Zoom like this. Right. And so she and I were together, you know, and, and we would go out for a walk in the afternoon and just kind of walk around town. And to me, walking is an exercise, but it became mm -hmm. just a, a routine and a habit that got us out. It let our brain kind of switch off. It just mm -hmm. let us take some time to take a deep breath and to, um, you know, have the opportunity to try to bring us back and center us a bit as opposed to just all of this anxiousness right. about what's going on and how do we help and um yeah so routine and consistency that's always my my diet for any type of self-care yeah that's great advice you know i think the me time is definitely important nowadays you know for everybody's mental health to so just take a second and unwind so and um, again you know there's a lot of me time is a privilege as well there's a lot of people who true. can't access me time and who uh, might need help and, and you know I want to be that person that they can yes. call you know there's a lot of services that the state provides for yes. counseling mediation stuff like that so there's resources right. out there don't be afraid to ask people for help right right now my closing question so in a position like yours could you tell me about your favorite part of your job and then maybe the most challenging part of your job <laughs> <laughs> they might be the same thing uh, <laughs> my favorite part of my job is the people, both the people I work with, but also the people that I get to interact with, the people that I get to engage with. The Cape is an incredibly special place to me. It's home where I was born and raised. It, provide, it, it provided, you know, so many opportunities for me. It's such a beautiful place. Anywhere I went in the world, I could tell people I was from Cape Cod and they would know it. They've heard of it. They, you know, they have that idealistic picture in their mind. Mm -hmm. We're so lucky, but it's a tough place for a lot of people. And we have mm -hmm. to remember that. Um, so definitely getting to work with people to try to help them, to try to, you know, see how we can assist towns, to see how we can help organizations. Can we get them some more money so that they can expand their services? That's really been the one, um, you know, I mean, it, I feel selfish saying this, but it's a, it really has been an opportunity to try to give back and make some impact. And I won't pretend to think, you know, that I have made a great impact, but, um, you know, any person, any organization that I've gotten to work with and help has really been the absolute passion and the best part of this job, but also the most challenging one. Because like I said, I often can't do enough. I often can't get the results that I want for people, or I can't get the money that we want for certain organizations. You know, there's hundreds of organizations right, re reaching out about a grant opportunity and, you know, inherently they're not all going to get selected or whatever it might be. Um, right. So that's challenging. And also just, you know, there's a lot wrong in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, we've got to start thinking about how we refocus our energy and mm -hmm. our attention and our energy, um, you know, and just start to figure out ways that we can create new systems, new structures to support everyone. Yes. Um, and, and that's the frustrating thing is sometimes I run into these hurdles, you know, where you just can't get over some obstacle with an agency or with an organization, or whatever it is. And, you know, you, you feel like the solution is just so simple and obvious, but there's just no pathway to get there. So sure. the limitations that we have, you know, we've just got to start thinking differently and reshifting re re the paradigms to, yeah, you know, right. to adapt to a new world, which it certainly will be after COVID. Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, that wraps up our mini interview, Jeffrey. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. Um, I know the guidance and insight you've given will be a great resource to all the students, so I thank you. Well, it was a privilege, like I said, working with students and, um, you know, I, I just always think what would have helped me back then? And it seems like a lifetime ago, but it also really wasn't that long ago, you know, um, and so I just always think of what could have helped me because I was a shy, awkward, uncomfortable, <laughs> quiet little kid and I did not reach out to people yeah. um, and though I still consider myself pretty shy and quiet and awkward. Oh. Yeah. It, it really is a privilege to be able to try to feel like I'm doing some small part. You definitely are. You definitely are. I mean, you gave such great advice and all the opportunities you have done for everyone has been so amazing. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.